This world is beyond ruin. Life has been remolded and the cycle has begun anew. Tales are told of a legend. A legend which could change this world, stabilize it. The legend of the nuclear throne. One of us has already reached the nuclear throne. In a palace that's guarded by unspeakable horrors. Sentient beings of pure radiation. They called him the Proto-Mutant. No one knows why, but when the Proto-Mutant found the throne, the world stayed the same. For all we know, he simply kinged himself and enjoyed the limitless power of the throne. This world is a radiated wasteland. It wasn't always like this though. What changed things was the nuclear apocalypse jump-starting the creation of abominable, contorted creatures. Most enemies drop radiation upon death. The amount of radiation within you is an indirect representation of how powerful you are. When you absorb enough radiation, you can choose to mutate yourself, making you more powerful. All these mutations are unique and provide an extra layer of fun and death to a mutant. Absorbing enough radiation allows you to pick an ultra mutation, which are unique to every mutant and is usually the most powerful mutation they will get. Radiation is one of the most important themes, to the point where it is crucial to everything present. Not all, but the majority of the mutants are here because of the radiation. Some were directly birthed by it, and others were indirectly shaped by it. Fish is, shockingly, a fish. When the apocalypse happened, he was transformed. He has access to a quick dash which can help him escape danger. He also obtains more ammo from ammo sources, allowing him to use more powerful weapons for longer. Melting is in constant unbearable agony due to his body constantly melting from the radiation. He's extremely fragile but is also one of the most powerful mutants. Firstly, enemies killed by him release more radiation, allowing him to mutate faster than the other mutants. Secondly, his ability allows him to explode corpses, which often causes extremely powerful chain reactions. When he's able to get the right combination of weapons and mutations, melting is probably the most dangerous force across the wasteland. Young Venus is an interdimensional space gangster who has his own mansion. He's a gun god, which means that he's basically invincible and does not age. Instead of dying, he simply teleports away. He isn't actually bothered by the apocalypse, but rather he came to a wasteland for fun. Young Venus is capable of large amounts of destruction due to his ability to shoot faster than the other mutants. Rogue is the only true human amongst the other mutants, since she hasn't been physically malformed. She's an ex-member of the Interdimensional Police Department. Consequently, she's also constantly chased by the IDPD for betraying them. Rogue has access to powerful armor and is able to call in a sort of missile strike, which can be incredibly dangerous, but also incredibly rewarding. The Interdimensional Police Department is a mysterious organization that often interferes with the mutants and attempts to prevent them from becoming too powerful. Instead of becoming powerful through the use of mutations, they instead become powerful through state-of-the-art technology. However, if the mutant chooses to mostly stay on the main path, the IDPD shouldn't be too much of a problem. Throughout the mutant's progression, they will enter various different areas with each area being noticeably more dangerous than the last. The first area is the desert, being the least threatening. The bandits, being the inhabitants of this area, deem the mutant a threat. However, they're not that dangerous, so they can be disposed of fairly easily. Once the mutant reaches the end of the desert, the guardian appears and tries to stop them in their tracks. The guardian looks like a grown version of the common wasteland bandit, and is more intelligent with him being able to speak proper trash talk, whereas the bandits can only speak a simplified version. After finishing the desert, a portal opens up that takes the mutant to the next area. Due to the apocalypse, portals started opening up to transport anything nearby across to the next portal, which is how the mutants travel between areas. After the desert comes the sewers, 
a singular transitional area which will lead to the scrapyard. The sewers are shrouded in darkness and have a more melancholic tone compared to the desert. This area houses rats and other mutagenic creatures and has a generally gross appearance. Exiting the sewers brings you to a scrapyard. The scrapyard is noticeably more dangerous than the desert. You can often see radiation seeping through the floor. The entire area is filled with cars that are no longer being used with them being abandoned after the apocalypse. These cars are still able to explode however, which often creates moments of pure chaos. The creatures are now out for blood, rather than just simply protecting their home. The end of this area is protected by a horrible contorted being, mutated by the apocalypse, equipped with dangerous weaponry. The mutant makes her way through crystal caves, filled with literal living crystal that resemble spiders. The area after the frozen city is a frozen habitat filled with robots. The robots have clearly been here for years, them being unclean and showing battle scars. It's unknown how the robots got here, but they were presumably built for killing. Either that, or they somehow gained life through the radiation. The guardian of this area is an abandoned IDPD member gone insane. The next area, the labs, is home to what can only be described as abominations. The labs seem to have contained some sort of experiment, which was presumably abandoned after the apocalypse. The experiments you see around the labs resemble amalgamations of the mutants, along with a few of the mutations. There's a lot of computer systems here that I assume were used to document these abominations. These things were clearly not supposed to escape captivity, as you can tell from them trying to break out display canisters. The labs are a fantastic display of atmosphere, and they make me think about what could have possibly happened here. One of the reasons the labs work so well is because of how short, yet how big of an impact they have. Horror is always about what is not shown, rather than about what is shown. The last area is the palace. This area is swarming with radioactive creatures, guardians, beings of pure, uncontrolled radiation. They seem like they're trying to protect something. Protect it from intruders. Protect it from you. This area is clearly of high importance, because IDPD troops are also getting involved, with varying results. As the mutant approaches the end of the palace, you see it. The nuclear throne. Unlimited power, literal steps away. The proto-mutant isn't even a shadow of his former self anymore. It seems like he perished long before we got here. Before the mutant is able to do anything, the throne comes alive a self-defense mechanism and starts a vicious assault. Lines of radiation are spewed across the palace. Spheres filled with capacity for death and destruction are rejected from the throne. There is no match for the mutant, the throne is quickly defeated. Having stopped leaking radiation, the throne now lies dormant. The mutant sits on the throne. Finally. Time for change. <laughs>